Chapter 8, Inoculation, Godsend, or Danger The theory behind inoculation was not new. For centuries, Chinese doctors had conferred immunity on people by blowing dust from the scabs of smallpox patients up the nostrils of the healthy. This often produced a mild infection in the patient, but from then on, he or she was immune to any further attacks of the disease. Country people in Eastern Europe also practiced a similar form of immunization, which they called buying the smallpox. But most Europeans and Americans had never heard of the practice until the Journal of the Royal Society published the letter that Cotton Mather read. It told how inoculation had been used to help them stem an outbreak of pop smallpox that had struck the city of Constantinople, now Istanbul, in Turkey, in 1706. Soon after the letter appeared, an unusual English woman, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, began to promote the idea of inoculation. Lady Mary, a talented poet and tireless letter writer, was the wife of the British ambassador to Constantinople, then the, cop the capital of the Ottoman Empire. She had strong personal reasons for being concerned about smallpox. Her younger brother di died of the disease, and she herself had survived a severe attack that left her without eyelashes and with a badly pockmarked face. She wrote a poem about the experience that began. In tears, surrounded by friends I lay, massed o'er the trembling at the sight of day. In Constantinople, Lady Mary heard of inoculation and described the practice in a letter to a friend in London. The smallpox, so fatal and so general amongst us, is here entirely harmless by the invention of ingrafting, which is the term they give it. There is a set of old women who make it their business to perform the operation every autumn in the month of September. Then the great heat is abated. Unlike the Chinese, the old women of Constantinople scratched the recipient's upper arm in, and injected the powdered scabs from a smallpox patient in the scratch rather than up the nostrils. As in China, the inoculation caused a mild case of smallpox to develop. Once the person recovered, however, he or she would, would usually be safe from the disease forever. Every year, thousands undergo this operation, Lady Mary went on. There is no example of anyone that has died in it. And you may believe I am well satisfied of the safety of this experiment, since I intend to try it on my dear little son. In 1718, without her husband's knowledge, Lady Mary had her five-year-old son inoculated by an old Greek woman. Working alongside the woman was the embassy physician at Charles Maitland. The boy came through the procedure with no ill effects whatsoever. A week later, Lady Mary told her husband about the inoculation, assuring him that their son was, at this time, singing and playing and very impatient for his supper. The Montague family returned to London a year later, and in 1721 a new smallpox epidemic hit the city. This time, Lady Mary decided to have her four-year-old daughter inoculated against the disease. Dr. Maitland performed the operation, which was reported in the newspapers. It was the first professional inoculation to be done in England, and was hailed as a complete success. Among those who read the reports were members of the British royal family, including Princess Caroline, wife of the Prince of Wales, the future King George II. She had almost lost one of her daughters to smallpox and wanted to have both girls inoculated. But some British doctors were strongly opposed to the notion. One, Dr. William Wagstaff, wrote, Posterity will scarcely be brought to believe that a method practiced only by a few ignorant women amongst an illiterate and unthinking people should be on a sudden and upon slender experience, so far obtained in one of the most learned and polite nations in the world as to be received into the royal palace. To overcome the opposition, Princess Caroline arranged to have Dr. Maitland inoculate six condemned prisoners at Newgate Prison, while the king's physicians looked on. All the prisoners survived the inoculation and were granted their freedom as a reward. Then, to be doubly sure, the princess ordered the inoculation of all the orphans in London's St. James Parish. Only when she saw that the orphans, too, had come through the operation unharmed, did the princess allow her own two daughters to be inoculated by Dr. Maitland. Their recovery put the royal seal of approval on the procedure. In spite of this, inoculation was still not widely practiced in Great Britain. Some people feared that those who had recently been inoculated were experiencing a mild case of the disease would spread it to susceptible persons in the community.
Others objected to the procedure on religious grounds. Like the people of an earlier age who believed the Black Death was the will of God, they wondered whether inoculating someone with smallpox or permitting themselves to be inoculated would be seen as interfering with God's intentions. He would be angry with them, perhaps. Some British clergymen played on these worries. In a sermon delivered in 1722, the Reverend Edmund Massey cited Job, who suffered terribly in the Old Testament but never challenged God's tests of him. The fear of disease is a happy restraint to men, Massey said. If men were more healthy, tis a great chance they would be less righteous. Let the atheist and the scoffer inoculate. Their hope is in and for only this life. Let the rest of us bless God for the afflictions he sends among us and grant us patience under them. The resistance to inoculation only made Lady Mary Wortley Montague work harder to win acceptance for it. She visited patients recovering from the procedure and encouraged more doctors to perform inoculations. She also wrote letters to newspapers advocating the practice. I shall sell no drugs, nor take no fees, could I persuade people of the safety and reasonableness of this easy operation, she said in one letter. "'Tis no way my interest to convince the world of their errors. That is, I shall get nothing by it but the private satisfaction of having done good to mankind. Thanks to the efforts of Lady Mary and other supporters, by 1723 inoculations were being performed successfully on more and more English patients. Lady Mary must have felt vindicated. She wrote to her sister, I know nobody that has repented the operation, though it has been very troublesome to some fools who had rather be sick by their doctor's prescriptions than in health because of an inoculation. Uproar in Boston Meanwhile, in the Massachusetts colony, Cotton Mather had been waging his own campaign to promote inoculation. In June 1721, he stood in his pulpit and urged Boston's physicians to adopt inoculation as a means of halting the smallpox epidemic that was sweeping the city. Only one of Boston's ten physicians, Dr. Zabdiel Boylston, responded to Mather's call. Using a sharp toothpick and a quill, Boylston inoculated his six-year-old son Thomas and two African-American slaves with pus from a smallpox patient. All three developed mild infections, which left them immune afterward. Many of Boston's other physicians and ministers, as well as a part of the populace, were outraged that Boylston had deliberately infected three people with smallpox. Public meetings were held at which inoculation was denounced as a dangerous practice. As in England, the physicians expressed the fear that patients who had been inoculated would infect others while they were getting over the disease. The Boston ministers sincerely believed that using inoculations to prevent smallpox would be interfering with God's will. Tensions mounted to such a pitch that Dr. Boylston had to hide in his house for two weeks after an angry crowd threatened to drag him out and hang him. Someone threw a homemade grenade into Cotton Mather's house, but it failed to explode. Attached to the grenade was a note that read, Cotton Mather, you dog! Damn you! I'll inoculate you with this and a pox to you! As the months passed, the mood of the city calmed down somewhat. Dr. Boylston resumed his inoculations, and two other doctors joined him in performing them. Cotton Mather answered the charges of other ministers by preaching that God must be in favor of inoculation since it saved lives, but there were still loud rumblings of protest against the activities of both men. The controversy surrounding inoculation was brought home to Mather in a very personal way when his son Samuel asked that he be inoculated. Samuel's roommate at Harvard College had died painfully of smallpox, and Samuel feared he might contract the disease. Cotton Mather didn't know what to do. If he refused to let his beloved son be inoculated and Samuel died of the disease, how could Mather forgive himself? On the other hand, Mather wrote, our people will go on with infinite preju prejudices against me and my ministry if I suffer the operation upon the child. In the end, Mather's feelings for his son outweighed his worries about his reputation, and Samuel was inoculated by Dr. Boylston. The young man made a speedy recovery and proved to be a wonderful living advertisement for the inoculation process. 
When the smallpox epidemic in Boston finally came to an end in the spring of 1722, it was revealed that Dr. Boylston and his two colleagues had inoculated 280 patients. Only six of them died from the disease, a little more than 2%. On the other side, out of a pre-epidemic population of 11,000, more than 5,800 uninoculated Bostonians had come down with the smallpox, and 844, or 15%, had died. This seemed to prove beyond a doubt the benefits of inoculation. After its successful use in Boston, inoculation was employed to help fight smallpox epidemics in Philadelphia, New York City, and Charleston, South Carolina during the 1730s. Nowhere did the practice generate the kind of controversy it had aroused in Boston. Benjamin Franklin, then the editor of the Pennsylvania Gazette, promoted inoculation in Philadelphia, and the city became a center for the treatment. Patients from all the American colonies in the West Indies, too, traveled to Philadelphia to be inoculated. The well-to-do often made inoculation into a social occasion. Entire families or groups of good friends would arrange to be inoculated together and share the one or two weeks of required isolation afterward. Abigail Adams took her four children to the home of of an aunt in Boston for their inoculations. There they recuperated together while her husband, John Adams, who was to become the second President of the United States, attended the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Because inoculation was quite an expensive procedure, Benjamin Franklin and others urged that ways be found to make it available to the poor as well as the rich. Responding to their call, Philadelphia established the Society for the Inoculation of the Poor in 1774. Through the efforts of the Society and similar organizations elsewhere, the death rate from smallpox dropped sharply in the cities along the eastern seaboard during the later years of the 18th century. One group of Americans was overlooked as the colonies moved to adopt inoculation on a wider scale. These were the members of the Native American tribes who tri- who lived in the vast region beyond the colony's western bo- boundaries. In fact, far from trying to control smallpox among Native Americans, the settlers sometimes plotted to spread the disease among them. The most notorious example of this occurred in 1763. That was when Sir Geoffrey Amherst, commander-in-chief of British forces in North America, became alarmed by Native American attacks on his troops as the British moved westward. In a letter to one of his colonels, Amherst made a drastic suggestion. Could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among these tribes of Indians? We must on this occasion use every stratagem in our power to reduce them. The colonel replied, I will try to inoculate, in fact, the Indians with some blankets that may fall in their hands and take care not to get the disease myself. Amherst was all in favor of the colonel's plan. You will do well to try to infect the Indians by means of blankets, he wrote, as well as to try every other method that can serve the, to ex, extirpate this execrable race. Shortly after, the colonel invited two Native American chiefs to the British camp. He told the chiefs he wanted to resolve the tense military situation that existed between the two groups. An officer who was present revealed the true purpose of the meeting in his diary. Out of our regard for the chiefs, we gave them two blankets and handkerchiefs out of the smallpox hospital. I hope they will have the desired effect." It is not known for certain whether they did or not, but Native American resistance to the British and American forces weakened noticeably in the next few months. It may well have been due to the colonel's poisonous gift. Smallpox and the American Revolution During the American Revolution, which began in 1775, smallpox was a bigger problem for the American army than it was for the British. More British soldiers had had the disease, naturally or through inoculation, and thus more of them were immune to it. The American leader, General George Washington, was well aware of the damage smallpox could do. He himself had survived an attack while visiting his brother on the island of Barbados in 1751, but it had left his face pockmarked. Now, not wanting to lose any of his soldiers to the disease, General Washington moved cautiously. When the British gave up Boston in 1776, Washington at first would let only a thousand American soldiers who had already had smallpox enter the city. He was worried that his other soldiers might contract the disease from contaminated objects like sheets, 
and towels that the British had left behind. At first, Washington and the other American commanders were hesitant to launch a major campaign to inoculate American soldiers. They feared the soldiers would spread the disease to their fellows while they were in the contagious phase. Eventually, Washington changed his mind about mass inoculations. He decided the risk was worth it if the health of most of his men could be preserved. I would fain hope, Washington wrote, that in a short space of time we shall have an army not subject to this, the greatest of all calamities that can befall it. From all the evidence, Washington's inoculation policy worked. Although the American army suffered many setbacks, it was never laid low by a major smallpox epidemic, and it finally triumphed over the British at the Battle of Yorktown, Virginia in 1781. As inoculation became more commonplace in Europe and America, the death rate from smallpox continued to decline. Epidemics broke out occasionally, however, hitting large, crowded cities like London especially hard. The majority of the victims were young, poor children who had not been inoculated. In some English cities, such as Manchester and Birmingham, nine of every ten persons who died of smallpox were under five years old. A French doctor in the late 1700s estimated that, despite the widespread use of inoculation, one-fourth of the human race was still being killed, blinded, or disfigured for life by smallpox. But a new means of prevention was about to be discovered, one that would bring the disease under control at last. This was vaccination. Chapter 9. Dr. Jenner's Marvelous Vaccine When Edward Jenner was eight years old, he had a painful experience that he never forgot. Later, it helped inspire him to seek a safer and more efficient means of preventing smallpox. Edward was the younger son of the rector of a little church in Berkeley, in the western English country of Gloucester. Both his parents died when Edward was five, and his older brother Stephen, a minister like their father, took charge of Edward's upbringing. Stephen was a well-read and open to new scientific ideas like inoculation. So when a smallpox epidemic broke out in Gloucestershire in 1751, Stephen arranged to have his younger brother inoculated with a number of other children. The inoculations were to be administered by a local pharmacist in a stable that he owned. First, though, he... The man bled Edward and the other children repeatedly over a period of six weeks, a procedure that dated to the time of the Black Death and even earlier. The pharmacist also gave the children large doses of laxatives to empty their stomachs. At last, the day for the inoculations arrived. Edward, like the other children, lay on a table while the pharmacist scratched his left arm with the tip of a knife, placed the dried scab from a smallpox victim over the cuts, and bandaged the arm. Edward could not go home afterward. Instead, he and the other children were forced to stay in the stable until the pharmacist judged they were no longer contagious. After about a week, Edward, like most of the others in the stable, came down with a mild case of smallpox. His temperature soared and the characteristic rash appeared on his skin. Within three days, though, his temperature went down and the rash gradually faded away. Shortly thereafter, the pharmacist told Edward he could go home to his brother. As he unlocked the stable door, the man clapped Edward on the shoulder and said he was now immune to any further attack of smallpox. But it took the boy almost a month to recover fully from the disease and the bleeding and purging that had preceded it. From early childhood, Edward had shown an interest in nature and science. Sensing this, his brother Stephen arranged for him to become, at age 13, an apprentice to a physician in a nearby town. It was while helping Dr. Daniel Ludlow that his, with his work that Edward first heard farm people say that they could not get smallpox because they had already had the cowpox. Cowpox, a relatively mild disease of cattle, usually caused a few blisters on, on the udders of infected cows. Milkmaids and other farm workers could acquire the disease when they milked su- sick animals. Painful sores broke out on their hands and sometimes left scars, but the disease soon passed and, unlike smallpox, was not fatal. Young Jenner was intrigued by the stories he heard about cowpox, providing its human victims with an immunity to smallpox. But Dr. Ludlow pooh-poohed them, saying that there was no evidence of a connection between the two diseases. When Edward had learned all he could locally, his brother sent him to London to study medicine with a prominent doctor there. Edward did so well that his teacher offered him a permanent position, but Edward decided he would rather return to his hometown of Berkeley to practice. 
1773, he converted a room in his brother's house into an office and set himself up as the town's only physician. A new smallpox epidemic struck Gloucestershire in 1778. As Jenner traveled around the country giving inoculations, he was often reminded of the stories about cowpox and how he and that he heard as a boy. Many farm workers whom Jenner approached flatly refused to be inoculated. They told him that, that they had already had the cowpox and that it prevented smallpox, so there was no need to give them inoculations. The farm workers' stubborn resistance made Jenner think they might be right. Over the next several years, he spent much time studying cowpox. He went to one dairy farm after another looking for cases of the disease. Some of the farmers welcomed him. Others thought he was odd or maybe even a little crazy. During his investigations, Jenner discovered that cowpox protected a person against smallpox only if he or she caught the disease when it was at its height in the infected animal. A day or two later, earlier or later, the, the case of smallpox that resulted would be too weak to provide immunity. He also got the idea that it might be possible, as with smallpox, to infect a person with a mild case of cowpox by inoculation. He thought this could be done first with a disease-laden matter from a cow. Then, matter from a score on the infected person could be used to inoculate other humans, but it wasn't until 1796 that he was able to test his theories. In May of that year, a local milkmaid named Sarah Nelms cut her finger on a thorn just before milking a cow that was suffering from cowpox. Soon, a large pus-filled sore appeared on Sarah's finger, followed by two smaller ones on her wrist. The young woman went to Dr. Jenner for treatment, and he realized that her infection was nearing its peak. This was the chance he had been waiting for. After a reassuring Sarah that she would recover, he asked her to come back in a few days when he estimated the cowpox sores would be at their worst. In the meantime, Dr. Jenner sought out an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps, who had never had either cowpox or smallpox. Although he could not guarantee the boy's safety, Jenner obtained the permission of James's parents to conduct an experiment on their son. When Sarah returned to Jenner's office, James Phipps was waiting there with the doctor. First, Jenner took some pus from the sore on Sarah's finger. Then, after making two small scratches on James's left arm, the doctor inserted the pus in the cuts. Afterward, he, was sent he sent both James and Sarah home. There was no need for the boy to be isolated, as Jenner once had been, since cowpox could not be transmitted from one human being to another. Jenner checked on James's condition every day. On the ninth day, the doctor wrote, he became a little chilly, lost his appetite, and had a headache. He spent the night with some degree of restlessness, but on the day following, he was perfectly well. Now came the risky part of the experiment. On July 1st, Jenner repeated the inoculation procedure on James Phipps, this time with matter from a smallpox patient. How would James react? Jenner thought the earlier cowpox infection would render the boy immune to the smallpox, but he couldn't be sure. Happily, Jenner was proved right. On July 19th, he reported on the results of the experiment in a letter to a friend. But now listen to the most delightful part of my story. The boy has since been inoculated for smallpox, which I, as I ventured to predict, produced no ill effects whatsoever. I shall now pursue my experiments with redoubled ardor. The following year, Jenner submitted a brief article to the Royal Society describing his experiments on James Phipps. However, it was returned to him with a note from the editor saying they found his evidence too thin. They also thought it most likely that anyone would believe cowpox could be used to prevent smallpox. Jenner did not let this rejection from the society stop him. He continued his experiments and in 1798 inoculated five more children with cowpox. Later, he followed up by inoculating three of the children with smallpox, and none of them became ill. Jenner was now more convinced than ever that his theories were correct. He wrote a pamphlet summarizing his findings, and this time he published it himself instead of trying to go through the Royal Society. In the pamphlet, Jenner called the matter he had taken from the cowpox or a vaccine, from the Latin for obtained from a cow. The process itself he called vaccination, to distinguish it from inoculation. Now the word vaccination is used for any immunization process that protects against a particular disease, and vaccines are obtained from many different sources. 
Other English doctors read to Jenner's pamphlet and conducted successful experiments of their own. Many of them published accounts that lent further support to his theories. Edward Jenner was elated. In a letter to a colleague, he predicted that annihilation of smallpox, the most dreadful scourge of the human race, will be the final result of vaccination. The good news about vaccination traveled far beyond the borders of England. Within a few years, Jenner's pamphlet had been translated into German, French, Spanish, Dutch, and Italian. Copies of the English edition were shipped across the Atlantic to the newly independent United States. In many places, vaccination soon replaced inoculation as a preferred method for preventing smallpox. Vaccination was simpler and cheaper than the earlier treatment since patients did not have to remain isolated for one or two weeks after being vaccinated. It was safer, too, because cowpox was a much less severe disease. Not everyone approved of vaccination, however. A British surgeon named John Birch feared it would eliminate a disease that he called a merciful means of reducing the country's poor population. Some religious leaders opposed vaccination on the familiar ground that it interfered with God's will. But many other ministers and priests endorsed the practice. In Geneva, Switzerland, one minister even permitted a doctor to hand out literature promoting vaccination when parents brought their babies to be baptized. Vaccinations and Epidemics Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse did more than any other individual to spread the word about vaccination in the United States. Waterhouse was a Quaker who had studied medicine in England, Scotland, and Holland before returning to Newport, Rhode Island to set up a practice in 1781. English friends sent him copies of Jenner's writings on the cowpox vaccine. Dr. Waterhouse recognized the importance of Jenner's discoveries and gave a talk about them at a meeting in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Then, Waterhouse proceeded to put Jenner's theories to the test by vaccinating his own five-year-old son, David, and six other members of his household. These were the first vaccinations performed in the United States. Later, Dr. Waterhouse inoculated David and the others with smallpox, and all of them resisted infection. As with James Phipps in England, vaccination had made them immune to the disease. Waterhouse performed more vaccinations in New England and published accounts on the results. In 1801, he wrote to President Thomas Jefferson asking his help in promoting vaccination throughout the country. Jefferson wrote back, I had before attended to your publications on the subject in the newspapers and took much interest in the result of the experiments you were making. Every friend of humanity must look with pleasure on this discovery, vaccination, which by which one more evil is withdrawn from the condition of man. With Jefferson's backing, vaccination was introduced in Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York City. Jefferson also explained the new preventative measure to a group of Native Americans who had gathered in Washington. The president brought in a doctor to vaccinate the tribesmen and gave them a supply of vaccine to take home along with instructions on how to use it. Many Native Americans were suspicious of vaccination, however. George Catlin, an artist who studied and painted the tribes of the Midwest, suggested why Native Americans felt this way. They see the white men urging the operation, vaccination, so earnestly, they decide it must be some new trick of the pale face by which they hope to gain some new advantage over them. Their suspicions had fatal consequences for several tribes when two great smallpox epidemics swept the Midwest. The first struck the region in 1801 to 1802 and the second between 1836 and 1840. Both epidemics were accidentally triggered by white traders as they journeyed up the Missouri River by boat. It took only one or two infected crewmen to spread the disease among thousands of Native Americans living along the river. Like the Aztecs in Mexico, the Incas in Peru, and their own fellows in the eastern United States, these peoples had never been exposed to smallpox before and had no defenses against it. The second epidemic lasted much longer than the first, and that claimed far more lives. It raged across vast areas of the West and virtually wiped out an entire tribe, the Mandans, who lived in what is now North Dakota. The Mandan population numbered about 2,000 men, women, and children when an American fur company steamboat approached their settlement on the bank of the Missouri in June 1837. 
The steamboat captain knew that the two of his sailors were ill with smallpox, but that didn't prevent him from stopping at the settlement to trade. The tribal chiefs came on board to welcome the captain and get a preview of his wares. They were infected unintentionally by the sick sailors and carried the disease back to their own people. Within days, countless Mandans fell ill. There was but one continual crying and howling and praying to the Great Spirit for his protection, George Catlin wrote later in his journal. Catlin was not present in the Mandan village during the epidemic, but heard what happened there from a white trader stationed at nearby Fort Clark. Nobody thought of burying the dead, Catlin went on. Whole families together were left in horrid and loathsome piles in their own wigwams with a few buffalo robes thrown over them, there to decay and be devoured by their own dogs. The disease spread to other tribes in the same epidemic, among them the Blackfeet, Cheyennes, and Crows. Major Joshua Pilcher, then the superintendent of Indian Affairs at St. Louis, estimated that at least 25,000 members of these tribes died within four or five months. As for the Mandans, only 30 or 40 of the original 2,000 survived the epidemic. Dazed and grief-stricken, they were enslaved by the Rickarees, an enemy tribe living, living 200 miles south on the Missouri. The Rickarees moved up and took possession of the Mandan's village because it was better built than their own. Although there is no evidence that they were started deliberately, the smallpox epidemics of the early 19th century further, furthered the expansionist goals of the young United States. By weakening the Native American tribes of the Midwest and the West, the epidemic made it easier for the United States to lay claim to Western land. Meanwhile, new advances were being made throughout the world in the ongoing struggle against the disease. Several of them concerned improvements in the vaccination process. British doctors realized that vaccinations did not always provide lifelong immunity when some people who had been vaccinated developed mild cases of smallpox a few years later. To counter this tendency, the doctors recommended that the average person be re-vaccinated every 7 to 10 years. The new policy was introduced in Great Britain and elsewhere in 1829 and made vaccination an even more reliable safeguard against smallpox. As time went on, it was found that arm-to-arm -arm vaccination from one human being to another could sometimes be dangerous. If the donor was infected with a disease besides cowpox, he or she might transmit it to the recipient along with the vaccine. This problem was solved when a scientist in Italy discovered a way to produce a steady supply of high-quality vaccine in cattle. Now there was no need for an infected person like Sarah Nelms to be used as a source for, of cowpox vaccine. By the middle of the 19th century, vaccination had won acceptance in many parts of the world. Massachusetts passed a law in 1855 requiring that all school children be vaccinated, and New York and other states would soon follow its example. England banned inoculation in 1842 and decreed in 1853 that all its citizens be vaccinated instead. Not everyone was in favor of these new laws. Some saw them as an example of government interference with matters that should be left to individual or family choice. Others were simply afraid of being vaccinated. The English humor magazine Punch poked fun at these fears when it published the following poem in 1881. It was patterned on the famous soliloquy, To Be or Not to Be, from Shakespeare's play Hamlet. <clears throat> to vaccinate or not, that is the question. Whether tis better for a man to suffer the painful pangs and lasting scars of smallpox, or to bear arms before the surgeon's lancet, and by being vaccinated end them. Yes, to see the tiny point, and say we end, the chance of many a thousand awful scars, that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished." As the 19th century neared its end, more and more people followed the advice of the poem's narrator and got vaccinations. Germany enacted a law requiring all German children to be vaccinated before their second birthday and re-vaccinated at age 12. Enforced strictly, the law virtually eliminated smallpox as a public health problem in Germany. Similar laws in other countries showed equally positive results. Taken together, they made it seem as if Edward Jenner's optimistic prediction would be proved correct. Vaccination might really bring out the annihilation of smallpox. Chapter 10. The End of Smallpox? Starting in the 1890s, one country after another 
report, reported that vaccination campaigns had wiped out smallpox within its borders. Sweden was the first in 1895. Puerto Rico initiated an island-wide effort that eliminated the disease in 1899. It vanished from Great Britain, the Philippine Islands, and the Soviet Union in the 1930s. The United States moved more slowly to eradicate the disease. Some Americans refused on religious grounds to have them selves or their children vaccinated, while others saw compulsory vaccination as an infringement of their civil rights. This led a highly respected scientist, Dr. C. V. Chapin, to state in 1913 that the United States was the least vaccinated of any civilized country. But the situation gradually improved, and by the late 1940s, the United States, too, was free of smallpox. Then came one last alarming outbreak of the disease in New York City. In March 1947, an American businessman who had been working in Mexico City got off a bus in New York feeling ill. Taken to a hospital, he was diagnosed as having acute bronchitis. Only after the man died did the doctors realize that he had actually been suffering from smallpox. The man had come into contact with a number of people while on a bus and in, a hosp and in the hospital, and two of them fell ill with the disease also. The media took up the story, and a smallpox scare ensu ensued. New Yorkers feared the city might be swept by a full-scale epidemic. City health officials responded by announcing a mass campaign to vaccinate or re-vaccinate everyone who lived in New York. With the help of the Army and Navy, the teams of doctors, the campaign was set in motion. By April 20th, just a little more than a month after the businessmen fell ill, more than 3,450,000 New Yorkers had been vaccinated and no new cases had been reported in a week. The smallpox scare ended as swiftly as it had begun. Inspired by success stories like this, and the fact that smallpox had been wiped out in most of the industrial countries, a movement began in the United Nations to rid the entire world of smallpox. Two new advances in vaccination made this goal seem possible for the first time. One was a more efficient needle for mass vaccinations. The other was a way of freeze-drying vaccines so that it would retain its potency for months while without fruit refrigeration in almost any climate. With these tools in hand, the World Health Organization of the United Nations adopted an ambitious resolution in 1966. It called for the final eradication of smallpox through the combined efforts of all member nations and set January 1, 1977 as the deadline for this to be accomplished. At the time the resolution was passed, 44 countries were still reporting cases of smallpox and the disease was endemic in 33 of them. Those involved with the eradication program faced many challenges as they prepared to launch their worldwide campaign. Most crucial was the need to prove that smallpox could be wiped out in poorer countries whose transportation systems, sanitation facilities, and health services all tended to be inadequate. Ways to overcome these hurdles were discovered out of sheer necessity during the eradication campaign in the West African country of Nigeria. Until then, standard policy had been to conduct mass vaccinations of entire populations. But when an expected shipment of vaccine failed to arrive in Nigeria, the local advisor, Dr. William Fogey, had to make do with the limited supply he already had on hand. Dr. Fogey decided on a new policy that he called surveillance and containment. Instead of performing mass vaccinations throughout the country, he and his staff waited until an outbreak of smallpox was reported in a particular household or village. Then they traveled to the place and vaccinated only those people in the vicinity who might have been exposed to the disease. Dr. Fogey's policy was so successful in Nigeria that other African eradication teams adopted it. As a result, smallpox was completely eliminated in 20 West and Central African countries in less than three and a half years. The surveillance and containment policy was equally successful elsewhere. Brazil, the only country in the Americas where smallpox was still endemic, became free of the disease in 1971. Indonesia reported its last case in January 1972, and by the end of 1972, outbreaks of smallpox continued to occur in just six countries, four in Asia, including India, and two in East Africa. A terrible epidemic killed more than 25,000 people in India in the spring of 1974. Health workers in India had to overcome numerous obstacles as they struggled to bring smallpox under control. 
Worshippers of the Indian smallpox goddess, Sitala, feared that she would vent her anger on them if they allowed themselves to be vaccinated. The health workers had to convince these believers that the goddess would approve of their vaccination. When necessary, the workers made house-by-house searches for smallpox cases. If they found any, they vaccinated everyone within a three-mile radius of the infected family. In the meantime, the disease victims had to remain isolated in their homes, like victims of the bubonic plague in 17th century London, till they were no longer contagious. India's beggars, some of them professionals, presented a special problem. The beggars often traveled from village to village, and these infected with smallpox spread the disease as they went. Moreover, sick beggars refused to be isolated, saying they would have no income if they left the streets. So health workers came up with a practical solution to the problem. They offered to provide the beggars with food and shelter until the isolation period was over. By late 1974, 236 specialists in epidemic diseases from 30 nations were contributing their knowledge and experience to the eradication campaign in India. Working closely with them were thousands of Indian specialists and health workers. As a result of their joint efforts, the number of new smallpox cases declined sharply throughout the country in the early months of 1975. Then came the day all the specialists and health workers had been waiting for. On July 4, 1975, the last person in India to suffer from smallpox was released from an isolation hospital and returned to her home. Now, new cases of smallpox were being reported only in two East African countries, Ethiopia and Somalia. The disease was eliminated in Ethiopia by 1976, but it persisted among the nomadic peoples of Somalia. When an outbreak occurred, these Somalis did not want to be confined in their tiny huts or in large remote isolation camps run by the government. Health workers in Somalia came up with a solution to the problem that was similar to the one used with the beggars in India. Special isolation areas were created near nomadic encampments where smallpox had broken out. Each area consisted of a hut of wood and thatch and a surrounding fence made of thorn bushes. Guards were posted at the gate, the only gate in the fence, to make sure no one entered or left. A cook was assigned to the area and given better food to prepare for the smallpox sufferers than they were likely to get outside. When the sufferers recovered and were released from isolation, each of them received new clothing, a gift of World Health Organization. Once this isolation policy was put into practice, it brought quick results. Victims of the disease were no longer reluctant to be confined, and in November 28, 1977, the last known smallpox sufferer in Somalia left an isolation area and rejoined his family. To preserve or destroy... The World Health Organization did not claim immediate victory in the eradication campaign. Instead, it sent observers to countries where smallpox had been endemic to make sure it was really gone. While this search was going on, the disease made one last deadly appearance in a country where it had been long absent. In September 1978, a small amount of smallpox virus escaped accidentally from a research laboratory in Birmingham, England. It infected a medical photographer named Janet Parker and her aged mother. The mother survived, but Parker died. So did the head of the laboratory, who felt so guilty about the incident that he took his own life. A year later, in 1979, the World Health Organization made a long-awaited announcement. The results of its survey were in, and the word was that smallpox, a disease that had killed millions of people over more than 3,000 years, had been totally eliminated from the earth. In light of this happy development, World Health Organization recommended that vaccinations against smallpox be stopped everywhere. The United States and other countries had ceased routine vaccinations of children and travelers in the early 1970s, but the armed forces of several nations, including the United States and the Soviet Union, were still being vaccinated. Scientists and health workers throughout the world rejoiced at World Health Organization's announcements. At the same time, they remembered what had happened in Birmingham and worried about the stockpiles of smallpox virus that laboratories and many nations possessed. Might the disease come back to frightful life if similar accidents occurred at one or more of these laboratories? Responding to the scientists' concerns, some nations voluntarily destroyed their stocks of the smallpox virus. 
Others handed them over to research centers in the United States and the Soviet Union, depending on which superpower they were closer to politically. By the late 1980s, only 600 tiny vials of smallpox virus remained. All of them were frozen in liquid nitrogen and were handled only by scientific workers wearing special protective suits. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control stored 400 of the vials at a laboratory in Atlanta, Georgia. The other 200 vials were kept in a special freezer in Moscow, the capital of the Soviet Union, and were watched over by a regiment of army officers. In 1990, the World Health Organization urged that the last two stocks of smallpox virus be destroyed. The organization, expressing the anxieties of many member nations, feared what would happen if the virus were used in a biological warfare, or if it somehow got into the hands of terrorists. First, the United States, and then the Soviet Union, decided to support World Health Organization's position. December 31, 1993, was set as the deadline for the final destruction of the virus stocks, probably by heating them to a very high temperature. By that, by that date, World Health Organization thought scientists in both countries would have completed their studies of the virus and how it worked. As the deadline neared, arguments went back and forth in political and scientific circles. On the one hand, there were those who believed that the sooner the virus was destroyed, the better, so that smallpox would never again be a threat to humanity. On the other, there were scientists who said they needed more time to study the structure of the virus. They contended that a better understanding of the smallpox virus might provide clues that would help in the struggles against other scourges such as cancer, inherited genetic diseases, and even some forms of heart disease. World Health Organization decided in favor of the scientists who wanted the virus's destruction to be delayed. December 31, 1993 came and went, and the vials of virus stayed in their closely guarded freezers in Atlanta and Moscow. In June 1994, World Health Organization extended the reprieve for another year until the end of May 1995. Later in 1994, a uh, 10-member committee of World Health Organization recommended unanimously that the smallpox virus be destroyed once and for all on June 30, 1995. There were still some scientists who favored preserving the virus, however. They pressured the executive board of World Health Organization, which failed to approve its own committee's recommendation that the virus be destroyed. Thus, the smallpox virus was given at least another one-year stay of execution until June 1996, and the postponement could be indefinite. Meanwhile, another deadly virus had captured the world's attention, one for which an effective treatment, let alone eradication, was nowhere in sight. This, of course, was AIDS.